Hello everyone, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Hello and happy Africa Day. Uh, so my name is Samantha Siwusaran and I'm the chair of the International Committee of the Chartered Institute of Public Relations, which is the world's only charter body for the public relations industry. So it's really a pleasure to be here today as part of Africa Communications Week, which has already presented some really thought provoking sessions this week so far. Um, so my name is Samantha, I'll be here as your moderator for today's session, uh, where we're going to be looking at the very timely theme of building digital bridges, shaping the future of African communications. So I'm delighted to be joined by a really expert panel um, who I'll now be introducing. So first, uh, Mig Samansky, um, who is a specialist in African entrepreneurial development. So uh, great to have you with us here, Mix. Uh, Mix was in the teaching profession before being headhunted to join one of the leading incubators in South Africa. Um, he's worked and mentored over 6,500 entrepreneurs at all different stages. He's run his own business. Um, he was a guest speaker around many SMME developments for corporates. Um, he's worked across a whole range of different activities across fintech, edtech, biotech, uh, in different clusters for different organizations. Um, he's also been on the board of the Wheat Trust, which, uh, which is dedicated to the upskilling and uplifting of disadvantaged women through skills and entrepreneurial development. And, uh, and how I know him myself is through his role as the uh, CEO, uh, formerly of the Mauritius Africa Fintech Hub, uh, which sought to uh, position the, the country as a global fintech hub for the continent. Um, and this also led him to become a board member of the African Fintech Network, which represents over 34 African countries. And uh, just recently, Mix has now gone back into the entrepreneurial space, working with multinationals in East Africa to help grow the ecosystems and entrepreneurs from the region. So great to have you with us, Mix. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Femi, who is an executive director with BHM Holdings. So before joining BHM in 2014 as a PR officer and digital media lead, Femi worked for six years in consumer banking with roles in sales, marketing and operations. Uh, in 2015, Femi became the COO and later the CEO of ID Africa, which is BHM's Pan-African Communications Advisory Firm. So he's worked across a whole range of different uh, different disciplines. He's worked on digital marketing, public relations, strategic comms programs, um, and also across a wide range of industries, including financial services, tech, media, and consumer goods, among others. Uh, so Femi is also a chartered marketer with the Chartered Institute of Marketing from the UK. So uh, great to have you with us. Uh, next, I'd like to have uh, Nima as uh, submitted presented. So Nima Mutemi is the CIPR course lead from the University of Nairobi. Um, and she's also the managing director of Perspective Limited and the senior consultant at Woodrow Communications. So she brings around 17 years of experience across PR and development communication for NGOs and also for the UN. Um, she's also worked as a senior government advisor on strategic communications and youth livelihoods developments. Uh, through USAID, GIZ, the World Bank, and Nairus International, just to name a few. Um, so currently, Nima is working on managing PR for three landmark cases involving Meta on algorithmic justice in Africa. Uh, I know we'll be happy to hear more about that. Um, she's also working on informing practice, on informing ESG practice for the tech industry. And, uh, and as I said at the beginning, she's also working at the University of Nairobi teaching CIPR qualifications. So Nima, thanks for being here with us today. Um, and last, I'd like to introduce Laura Cook. Laura is the head of PR, social media and content marketing at Showmax, uh, where she's overseeing the, uh, the streaming division of multi-choice overseeing PR, content marketing, and social media for Showmax all across Africa. Under Laura's leadership, Showmax has won the online strategy of the year at the New Generation Awards, multiple bookmark group awards, and most recently, the Gold Award for Best Arts and Entertainment PR campaign at the 2022 Prisa Prism Awards. So uh, Laura, great to have you with us as well. So, uh, so before we get started then with the session, we'd just like to put the webinar into a bit of context in the discussion of borderless Africa, which is uh, of course the main theme for Africa Communications Week. So, uh, so of course, Africa, as we all know, is a very diverse continent, but for now people come up across a lot of barriers and borders in different ways. So there, there's a big political project in the form of the African Continental Free Trade Area. Um, it's being implemented slowly, but still today, intra-Africa trade is only representing around about 14% of African exports. So there's clearly still much more work to be done there. So, um, so now if we come on then to the communications arena, which is where we're going to be discussing uh, the points today, 
Um, we obviously know that Africa is, you know, one of the most, if not the most innovative and dynamic continents on earth, um, but how are we going to get there and how can the different communications aspects help us in that endeavor? So, uh, so we'll be looking today to see are there different bridges of different types, whether it's tech or fintech, uh, could be digital or data, youth, linguistic, and also cultural and entertainment aspects. Um, how can we bring all of this together, um, particularly if we don't look at these in isolation, but try to bring them together as a whole um, to see how digital first can really be meaningful. So, uh, so before we get started on the discussion, then I'd just say from a technical standpoint, um, we will be taking questions in the Q&A. So, uh, so if you see the Q&A function on the, uh, on the program here, then do, do already start putting in your questions as the seminar is, uh, is going along, and then we'll take them when we get to the end. So, uh, so Mix, I'll be happy to kick off with you. So, uh, so, so tell us then, as a former CEO of the Mauritius Africa FinTech Hub, um, and now you're a specialist working with UV Afri so UVU Africa, which is a non-profit, how do you see FinTech transforming African lives on the ground? Jeez, that's, uh, thank you, Sam, for that's a great start. But firstly, I feel underqualified to be here with the panelists. I'm the only one who doesn't have awards. So hopefully I'll live up to some high standards set by, by the other panelists. So from my side, uh, I'd like to break it down, Sam. So firstly, uh, the communications around FinTech, since we were in a, in a, in a communications panel, everything, if everybody wants to label everything as FinTech, okay? So the communications, we failed somewhere along the way. Anything to do with, I want to sound cool, throwing a word crypto, throwing a word digital enablement, you suddenly have FinTech. Right. So, you know, the way fintech's being communicated, I think there's been a lot of hype around it. I think most people just use the word as a catch-all phrase for everything. And I think there needs to be a, a I mean, you're now hearing wealth tech, fintech, fin, uh, insure tech, all these cool buzzwords being thrown around and actually it's confusing people more and more. Right. So from a communication perspective, I think it was, it started from a good point. I think it's been communicated badly. And now I met entrepreneurs earlier today who effectively they sell space, but because they're using blockchain as a technology, they think they were FinTech themselves. I'm going, what is going on here? Everybody wants to be called a FinTech because there's a lot of opportunities that exist on a continent. And we'll talk a little potentially around a little bit of funding because FinTechs are recognized right now as the, the hot news, the hot piece of cake on, on the continent, right? I mean, if you look at investments, 53% of all investments last year into startups is into the FinTech space. So suddenly everybody calls themselves FinTech. But from a transforming lives on why I used to do it and why I'm still doing it, I think the technology is a great enabler to, to allow people who have been excluded from the digital economy to come back and engage with the products and services that they've never been allowed to or haven't had a choice to even uh, interact with. So my passion, why I did FinTech for quite a while and I was, while I was in the space was because I, personally, I felt that being judged as a human being by amount of zeros you have in your bank account, how much money I, or financial assets or, or access I should have based on that, excuse my French, is BS, okay? How do you know I'm a good person today? I go through all the qualifications. You give me all of the, 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 the credit score. Today, I'm a good person. Tomorrow, I'm a bad person. You don't know, but I'm still able to get money at a better rate than somebody on the ground who doesn't have a credit score. I mean, so the, for me, the whole financial model around the world is skewed. It's skewed and creating a, an unequal society. And that's what I believe FinTech has the power and the potential on the African continent. How do we get, how do we move away from cash for, for a variety of reasons? And there's pros and cons. We're talking about central bank digital currencies and we're not going to get very nuanced around it. But at the, at the end of the day, how do we make sure that money moves from A to B and you, somebody doesn't lose 15 to 20% of their money, which is borderline theft in my viewpoint, because I'm sending money to my grandmother at home and then so she can afford to buy groceries, right? Why does it take nine people taking a piece of the pie in order for that transaction to happen? So for, for me personally, FinTech is about transforming lives. It's about bringing the costs down. It's about empowering people and giving consumers more choice. I'll use an example of an interesting model, for example, where the credit rating was built, a, a startup in, in Africa, where the credit rating wasn't built on how much money, how many transactions, how many assets you have. It was based on prepaid airtime, right? So as long as you're not even contract, so as long as you had airtime and you were topping up and prepaid, they built a financial model or a model around credit rating where that was enough for them to potentially lend you some extra money if you require to do so, right? So that's challenging the status quo. So for me, how fintech is transforming lives in specifically in Africa 
if you look at the numbers, 60%, for example, in Nigeria are people, adults are banked or underbanked, sorry, underbanked or non-banked at the moment. And that's not unique. That speaks for most of the countries on the continent, even South Africa. I mean, what is considered banked, right? If you have 17.3 million people on social grants with a bank account and they receive their money once a month and withdraw that money, and that's the only transaction they have, is that considered banked? I mean, we could have debates here ranging from a wide variety of aspects. But for me, it, it technology and fintech specifically in Africa and the solutions, like you mentioned earlier, coming from the continent are unique to the African context. And in my viewpoint, are world-class, revolutionary. I mean, we're doing stuff ahead of the West, ahead of the East, because there's a need and people build businesses around the needs to solve the social context. But we still tend to forget about the commercialization aspects or effectively communicating ourselves and our value that we can provide to the West and the East. So I went on a little bit of tangent there, but I think from that side, there's a lot of, FinTech has a lot of power to do good on the ground. Definitely. So, uh, well, thank, thank you very much, Mix, for getting us started. Um, so, so let's look on the communications aspects a bit when it comes to funding, um, because, I mean, funding is clearly a huge constraint for entrepreneurs. I mean, for most people, that's the biggest problem that they've got. Um, so, so how can communications help to catalyze the investment in fintech? Um, because we've also seen that you know, the foreign sort of VC market is slowing down a bit in view of all the different international issues that there are. Um, so, uh, so, so what do you think communications can do to actually help leverage that? So, so I'll break that down to, into, into two parts. So firstly, we as Africans tend to undervalue ourselves and we don't communicate the true value of what we can bring to any engagement. So that's why in most of the VC deals and investments coming to the continent, we just want the money and we undersell ourselves because we aren't effectively communicating with the, the real opportunities that exist on the ground. So I think there's a communication aspect in terms of attracting foreign investments, there's money available and it is slowing down across the field, but I still I feel we, we undervalue ourselves. And by we, I'm talking about all the entrepreneurs from all the countries, et cetera. We're so in need of the money that we just sell ourselves very much short. On the second part of it, from, a, from an entrepreneur point of view, I mean, you alluded to the fact that I've worked with a lot of entrepreneurs. I think people forget the, the, the power of communications. I've seen way too many times the best entrepreneur with the best business, with the best model, with the best product fail because they can't communicate effectively. Okay, It's really as simple as that. I mean, to give you an example right now, we've got doctors, so aeronautical engineers right now in Kigali, where I am at the moment, working on businesses. They are super smart people developing super smart solutions to problems that exist in the ecosystem. But let me tell you, you get them on a the stage to communicate and within two minutes, you're going, I have no idea what these smart people are saying because the communication isn't there. They can't communicate effectively what they're trying to do. So either the communication is too high, too technical, and you lose it, or they just don't know how to communicate effectively. So one of the skills that entrepreneurs actually lack is just the power to craft the story, craft the narrative, craft it in a, in a motion or flow that makes sense so that within two minutes, somebody knows exactly what the heck you're actually talking about, what your business does, what you do, what pain points, how you make money effectively. So for me, I think that's, the, that's funny enough, the bigger pain point, if I had to say that, than the attracting uh, the, the, the foreigners. If, you, if as an entrepreneur, you nail your communications down, and we've seen it time and time again, you can communicate effectively about what you're doing, how you're doing, et cetera, the money is easy. There's still a lot of money available out there from the continent, but from abroad, there's people looking and specifically looking into Africa. We just haven't got it right from a communication perspective to make people understand what we're actually trying to do. And that's funny enough, is a big comms problem. Great, thanks very much, Migs, for sharing your perspective. Uh, so let me move on now to, to Femi. Um, I mean, Femi is coming more from a sort of digital and data background. Um, so Femi, you've talked about, um, about technology-centric approaches in the past on an earlier panel, uh, where you've said that Black House Media, when it first moved into this domain, found that the trends of digital social were not very well embraced on the continent. So, so, so tell us a bit, how did that pose a challenge for your business and how did you manage to overcome it? All right. Thanks, Samantha. Um, I'll, I'll take us back to um, 2014, 2013, um, around the time I joined BHM. 
Um, it sounds funny now, but um, if you if you think back to that period, in most countries, at least in Nigeria uh, specifically, internet penetration was about 21%. Um, today, it's, it's about 55%. That's a huge leap from where we were then. And the level of expertise, understanding, and the level of um, the ability that the average communications professional had to manipulate, to make use of uh, digital communications tools. It's not exactly what, what we have today. Uh, so for, for us back then, it was majorly the challenge of, of recruitment, of finding experts to work with us to convert um, what we're doing in, in traditional PR communication uh, um, campaigns and uh, convert them into, into digital content uh, using digital channels, you know, applying a little bit of digital advertising a little bit of uh, digital content creation. So um, again, it's it's something that we probably don't pay, we, we don't consider as being special anymore. But at the time, it was it was a unique um, skill set that um, BHM had, and in fact, to a, to, a, to a, for a long time, we were boxed into a corner as those digital guys, and we had to fight again, you know, to get. Um, what I would call respect or, or or a seat on the table because people assume that you know we're only good for digital stuff. Now it's it's a blessing to be able to adapt um, digital tools to what we do in our work in communications and in PR. And I think uh, being very experimental, you know, being very adventurous, we we're, we're very young. Um, as an organization with an average age of about 23 at the time, I'm talking about 2014, 2015, still a young organization now, you know, probably 27, the average age right now. Um, and I think that was um, a blessing in the sense that young people are usually the early adopters of, of new technology. They are usually the ones to um, experiment and, and discover new ways of using new technology tools. And I think that was an advantage for our organization at the time. And I think um, the challenges then included the fact that it was difficult to find experts. So we just had to make things up as we go, as we as we went along. You know, we're learning along the way, experimenting with campaigns, experimenting internally. And through experimentation, we're able to find the best ways to, to use those tools. And um, another challenge was the fact that um, most of the brands we were working with at the time either didn't really fully appreciate the skill set or didn't see the fact that the digital um, um, ecosystem, and when I say digital ecosystem, I'm speaking more to digital media tools where uh, we're going to be ubiquitous as they are now, meaning they are everywhere in everything. And in fact, I think nobody calls themselves uh, digital marketers anymore like they, they, they once did because, you know, what, what kind of marketing are you going to do today that doesn't have some digital elements in it? So I think those were some of the challenges of, of, of those days. And um, I think everything quickly blew up and people quickly learned how to make use of these tools. Uh, one more challenge from that era and, and, and that became relatively um, threatening to the average traditional agency at the time was the fact that a lot of people from outside of public relations and outside of the core communications professions um, were taking the briefs of the agencies, you know, so to say, because you know it was all about who knew how to use Twitter, who knew how to um, make the most of Facebook, who knew how to use YouTube, and a lot of the brands were asking for this um, this skill set, and agencies couldn't provide the expertise they needed, and um, some of these briefs ended up with the so-called you know influencers. Um, a lot of advertising agencies took the opportunity to build digital. Um, um, expertise in areas that I, I personally believe that uh, PR pros should take uh, take the lead. For example, in social media management, that's a that's a pure PR function. But if you look at the the leading practitioners in that space, at least over the um, the, the decades, the, the 2010s, you realize that most of them came from the advertising world. And I think PR lost that opportunity a bit. I feel the same way about the AI wave that we are seeing right now with artificial intelligence. It's another moment, it's another 2010 period where um, a new technology is blowing up. Um, there's an explosion of AI tools popping up every day. And the question is, how are PR people going to take advantage of this? Are we going to wait and let uh, hardcore technologists take advantage of these tools 
to disrupt our industry. It's going to happen anyways, um, but how do we make sure that it happens well, and we have a say in, in where it leads us to? Um, I'm sure it's not only PR that, that will be the profession that will be disrupted by, by artificial intelligence and, and uh, AI chatbots, speech to text, uh, text to image, content editing, and all of these things. But the question is how are PR practitioners going to prepare for that? You know, So the lesson from the, the early social media era for, for me and for us is the fact that you know experimentation helps. Um, it helps to experiment, to play around with these things, and then adopt the, the use cases for the work that we do. So for me, those are the challenges, those are the lessons, and hopefully uh, with this new age of AI that is that is upon us, we're probably going to, uh, we are hopefully going to take advantage and not be left behind um, like the social media era. Great, thank you very much, Femi, for that. Um, so I'll just pose one further question. So, uh, so you've talked a bit about uh, about you know exports out of Nigeria in the past, such as you know, culture, entertainment, music, and film, and that these really do form a, a really major part of the country's appeal. So, uh, so how can we bring this together with a storytelling approach? To you? how can you tell those brand stories in Nigeria, but also across the continent? And uh, and how do you see those digital tools that you've just talked about helping us get on track there? Right, I. I... Interestingly, I and I may be biased for obvious reasons. I think Africans are the best storytellers um, in the world, um, and there are probably a couple of factors that that led to that. I think first, um, just the climate, the fact that it's a it's a warm country. With, you know, I grew up with uh, probably I'm 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 a, I'm an older. No, I'm not Gen Z, but I'm, I'm a young millennial. So I, I grew up in a period where I still managed to enjoy. Um, uh, moonlight story storytelling or you know, tales by moonlight with my grandparents. Um, so I'm one of the lucky few that enjoyed that before all of that passed away. And I think we we were raised um, in that storytelling culture. You know, you talk about the griots in West Africa. You talk about you know African stories generally. And so for me, we are generally storytellers. So that's part of our DNA. So that's important. Secondly, um, I think African stories have not been well told historically. If you look at um, what's happened on the continent over the past 100 to 200 years, you know, colonialism and everything else surrounded by that, our stories were told by, uh, by people outside of our continent. So I don't think they've properly represented us you know, the way they should have. So call it a post-colonial uh, brand identity management project of some sorts. I think Africans now need to be more aggressive about telling African stories, the African way. And we are such a diverse continent. Nigeria has probably 250 ethnic groups and languages. There, there's, there's just so much to do. And so for, for that alone, there's a ready audience in the, in the sense that African people love African stories. And we probably thought we didn't like our stories until technology came up and showed us that we truly loved our stories. Um, I remember in my, in my younger years, if you listen to Nigeria radio station, you probably hear 70% of all music from where from, from, from the US. And um, with government policy change, with um, just organic uh, um, um, creative explosion amongst young Nigerians, you found out that today, or you found out that a lot of people were producing more, there was more productivity in content creation. And the audience um, started consuming the content aggressively and passionately and became the key ambassadors that took our content global. Um, and I think that is just a signal and a sign that our content, our people love our content and will prioritize our content if it's delivered to them. So I think technology came and helped with the propagation and amplification of local content from Africa. What Showmax, what the likes of Showmax are doing with streaming, taking African film and African content across the continent from Nigeria to SA, from SA to Ghana and all over the place. And even beyond the continent, I think this is such a fantastic moment in time that, um, 
we just have to ramp it up and do more. You can see the music, you know, Amapiano is big in Nigeria. Um, Afrobeats is big in SA, is big in the West, you know, and people are adopting our culture, our sound, our music, and our people are getting to perform in global stages all over the world. You know, uh, Davido, Whiskey, Bonner, selling out the O2, selling out the Madison Square Garden, winning Grammy Awards without necessarily having to, um, to beg for it. You know, it's now right there in your face. So for me, I think what brands should just do is to authentically participate in what's already ongoing. Um, they don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, once your communication is authentic and it's authentically African and you are respectful of the culture, I think the people will recognize that um, and people will accept that. And um, with, with technology, with social media, with uh, streaming, audio streaming, video streaming, there's so much, the opportunity is, is unlimited, it's limitless right now. And I think if we are able to find the balance between Africans in Africa and Africans in the diaspora, who are our number one ambassadors outside of the continent, um, technology has bridged that gap and we just have to make the most of it as brands. Um, and the only thing I would say is brands have to be authentic about it. Uh, brands have to be respectful of the culture. Once you are pretentious, people will know. Nobody wakes up to say, oh, what does my favorite toothpaste brand have to say today, but they wake up and say, oh, what's, what's the Wasa Savage wearing today? Oh, who stems dating today? They care about what they care about. So brands just have to be respectful of that and not be too, and as marketers, we are, we are, we are surrounded by our brands. You know, we, we, we are soaked in it and we think we are more important than we really are. So I think we just need to step back a bit and recognize what's happening in the culture and tap into that. That's the opportunity that, that's available to us. Great. Thank you very much, Femi, for sharing all of your insights there. Um, so now I'd like to come on to Neymar on the topic of youth, which is obviously critical for Africa. Um, so well, let's talk a bit, Neymar, about the social media platforms. So obviously we have all of those old ones now, you know, Facebook, LinkedIn, and so on. We have WhatsApp, we have TikTok. Um, so, so now if we look a bit into the issues of cultural and linguistic sensitivities, how can they be built into such platforms to make sure that Africa paints the right image and also attracts the right visibility? Thanks, Sam. And wow, that's quite quite a tough question. I'm really hoping I'll do it justice. Uh, and I'd like to to pick up from you know what Femi um, where Femi started in uh, by introducing himself as a, a young millennial. And I think I I fall in the extreme end of that. So I'd call myself a very old millennial. <laughs> and by saying that, you know, I, I want us to rethink, um, you know, this cultural and linguistic sensitivity thing uh, from the lens of young people and be very, very aware that uh, there's already a disconnect, not just on the social media, you know, but even just us as the older Africans, we already have a disconnect in terms of culture and linguistic issues, right? So we start, but and that exists offline and of course it's carried along. So even as we carry on as champions for the youth of Africa, we're already carrying a lot of biases that do not relate at all to young people. Uh, and just, you know, giving that, and I, and I like to be aware that I also fall, you know, in the partly disconnected, uh, group when it comes to that because you know I try very hard to keep up with TikTok and Instagram and they're just too fast for me so if you feel if you feel me then you you do not represent young people and their views and what uh, what their culture is supposed to be so if we begin from there and then ask ourselves now uh, and, and I think I also wanted to to build on, you know, from something Migs introduced around inequalities. What role then does uh, do social media platforms play in shaping culture and linguistic, you know, um, uh, I, I wouldn't call it sensitivities. I don't have the word for it, but in in terms of even just shaping culture and the issues of the day. So uh, these social media platforms, when they started, I was in Campus, you know, Facebook. Um, and I think before I finished Facebook, before I finished campus, Twitter was born already. So uh, the way we envisioned their role in our lives, the way we envisioned their utility, you know, is very different from what they are today. They have completely metamorphosized and become, you know, the number one source of news. So when something important happens, most people today will, more than 70 
percent of people will find out on social media before they find out from a government statement or mainstream media you know and in fact it's even gone to the extreme where social media actually drives what we call news you know it defines what shows up and a lot of the people you know my age and older are left wondering why exactly is this in the news like wh why who, who is this important for but because you know the mainstream media companies also are catching on to what is actually you know trend setting you know and in pr we like to use the term agenda setting who is setting the agenda today it's these young people that I want us, you know, I, I know we are trying to solve a problem for them, but I want us to also see the position of power that they hold. They are very incredible, you know, agents for agenda setting. And, you know, now in the in the space, when you talk about, you know, uh, when you talk about uh, the role of social media today, we have to appreciate the contribution uh, of, 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 of the distortions of access, you know. So for those who have access, those who have bundles, you know, uh, and not just airtime, but ba proper bundles for hours of conversations and downloading videos, if you don't have equal ac access to those the tools you definitely do not have the same share of the piece of the pie so if you look at the african continent we have we have varying um uh levels of access and therefore varying levels of power distribution and uh when it comes to social media and communication we, are, we, we know information is power so if you have the distortion in power then you have a distortion in you know access and distribution of democratic governance, you know, and a lot of elections now are being decided on social media, again, by, you know, different levels of engagement and all that. So imagine yourself, imagine the youth of Africa, you know, in, in, in the extremes and in the middle, what levels, you know, of, of culture, you know, would you be talking about when you're talking to the extreme, you know, the TikTokers, those people who, who are posting 50 to 100 videos daily and photos and, you know, and, and then think about, you know, the, the, their cousins up country or who have, you know, power shedding, sorry, who have power shedding issues and what, whether they're able to engage. So when you're talking about democratic uh, governance, access to information, labor and employment, you know, again, social media has also completely changed the workplace. It's, it's completely changed the game in terms of whether qualifications that people graduate with from school are relevant in the marketplace, what kinds of jobs they have, how long they work, you know, and in a post pandemic uh, era that that becomes a very uh, useful one and even just understanding, you know, and demanding for their rights. So those are some, some of the different things that we have to bear in mind and just maybe to answer your question because you're very specific on the on the cases that you highlighted, you know, some of the things that are coming out of that is two things actually. Uh, we have what we call you know, the social media driven algorithmic marketplace of ideas. So who who benefit, who decides what you see and what you don't see? Okay, number two, who decides how far what you've seen or what you've just seen, how far does it go? How many other people and what what's the nature of those people who see the same message that you see? And then the third and most important question is who benefits from what you're seeing on social media? You know, and in terms of benefit, we look at it in two ways. Who benefits in terms of message amplification? Have you ever come across, you know, beautiful piece of content, even maybe Showmax, you know, trailer, which you think is fantastic, and you're wondering why does it only have three views? I honestly cannot be one of three people in the whole of Africa who liked this, and how comes it's not gaining as much traction? So who do, who benefits? And then you see a. a a, a piece of information you think is pretty useless with 100 million you know views and shares who benefits from messages message amplification and who benefits financially from the message uh, virality so that's what we look at when we're talking about you know uh, how the algorithmic marketplace of ideas is shaped and also when when it comes to algorithmic justice you know are there ways now that goes beyond just benefiting a few people over others to actually making putting you in danger for instance or uh, or contributing to 
you being denied access to crucial information that you needed, etc. So those are emerging conversations across, you know, Africa. There's and there's excite a level of excitement, you know, to to how some of these conversations are shaping up. Uh, we hope they will pick more traction in other countries, and you know, get the we are getting the AU involved. And let's see where it goes because for communicators as well, you know, and maybe we'll be talking a little later if I. If I have a follow-up, we'll be looking at how it has impacted, you know, traditional uh, practice of communication and PR. Great. Well, that's got us off to a cracking start there, Nima, for everything to do with the with social media. Um, so, one more question on this in terms of the impact, um, because yourself, you've obviously got uh, around, you know, fourteen years or so experience in the domain. Um, so, so tell us a bit about how can we really measure the impacts that all of this is having, and uh, and now, what about AI and data science? Like, how can they help us to, uh, you know, to build an evidence base to come up with the right communication strategies for all of this? That's actually one of the, my most exciting things, you know, in PR uh, is the measurement and um, measurement and evaluation, you know, part of it because it's so fast evolving. Because as as fast as you know, new tools are being developed, and you know, basically, you know, the AI revolution has completely, you know, changed. But I want people to remember, you know, that what has changed is, you know, the the common access to AI, you know, AI is not new. There's been a lot of, you know, AI that we've been using over the years. We just didn't know that it was called AI or that, that it was that, you know? So for instance, you know, in, in, in traditional PR, basically all the tools that we use for brand measurement, media me monitoring, social listening, most of those tools uh, uh, already use AI, right? Some declare, some don't. You know, RepTrack is one of my favorites and they, they actually have, usually have a few chapters just explaining the algorithms and, you know, what, what they use and, and they use it to produce the, you know, top 100 brands annually. Uh, but then we have Meltwater, Brand24, Brandwater, like basically all of them are, you have been using some form of AI. We also have tools that give you on-demand reports that you can find online, you know, some are free. Majority of them are using algorithms already. So the technology itself has been revolutionary. I think what, what has, what's new is who, who now has access to it. You know, just the fact that you can use it on your phone and you don't have to pay, probably pay, you know, you pay once and you have, you know, the technology or, you know, but, but again, you know, it has, opportunities and limitations. Again, uh, stepping up from the legal um, environment that the social media platforms are finding themselves in, new uh, regulations, you know, uh, GDPR, and you know, there's now the EU law on, you know, uh, on digital safety. They, they now don't have the freedom and the liberty to uh, avail personal information like they used to. You know, so when you actually think about it, you know, the information that they would pitch to you as a potential, you know, uh, advertiser or or if you've already paid and you're an advertiser, the information they give you, you know, telling you that, you know, you, you're able to reach Nema, you're able to reach Nema's daughter, you're able to reach Nema's mother. And this is the, you know, this are, these are the common, commonalities in this demographics and this is where they were listening from. You know, they don't have the liberty to disclose as much of, of that information as possible. So we have to keep ourselves abreast with uh, the legal developments when it comes to the, the evolution of, of some of these laws. But it, it's also um, good to also know some of these issues that have a dichotomy, right? So we've got a generation, we were just talking about youth, we've got a generation who did not give consent for their naked photos of when they were babies to be posted on social media by their mothers. So that's a, that presents an issue where you have your entire life documented on a platform where you do not own those images. And even your mother or father or whoever was posting doesn't, can't take them down. You know, there's no delete, you know, they, they just archive and you do not have you know, uh, ready access to ex how those images have been used, who has benefited, you know, there's a process, but how many people know that you can actually write to Facebook demanding to know all the ways and everyone who has been given your data, you actually can get a whole book explaining that, but it's something that, especially in Africa, we haven't uh, really activated, you know, uh, and the, on the other hand, the same, same group of people, 
who may be seen as disadvantaged from the other side are freely donating their data on TikTok, hours, hours of their time and you know their recordings and their dancing styles and you know their homes and we can see lots of information about them on Instagram and TikTok and you know that's they're giving consent literally to uh, insight uh, uh, and some are going live almost the whole day of their lives so you, you look at the two issues that are evolving at the same time and they create a whole array of of things that we need to think about so when we cut when my favorite approach to measurement and evaluation is you've got to go back to the basics what were we trying to say and to who and to what end and i like to bring in my data scientists at the beginning so that they can understand the approach they or, or even if they're not there from the beginning just take them through understanding why we were running a campaign or why we were doing this and then then work with them to determine you know, the metrics. What do we want to measure? What, what will that tell us? And what can we use that information uh, to, to inform? You know, is, it, is it to in, improve the campaign or is it to, uh, to give us insights for, for the future? And then they will, you know, in some cases, I, I work with amazing gentlemen you know, uh, at the University of Nairobi. We've got, you know, they are able to either even des design algorithms for us, you know, afresh, depending on which which online platform you you want to track, or they can, you know, prescribe a use of different tools, you know, that are going to give you different metrics. So I think this is something that's fast evolving. We have, and, and you'll even see the policies. I think uh, one of them was telling me Meltwater has also done some updates, you know, just saying that you won't be able to get this. You can now get, the, you know, some variations of this because everyone's responding to, uh, you know, the new laws and regulations. Uh, but what I've been struggling with, just look at all these companies. None of them actually is based uh, properly in Africa, you know, we need to start seeing more investments in PR measurements. We need these companies, like even RepTrack. How many African brands do they include in that? You know, so I think it's it's time. And you can't talk about you know sensitivity, cultural sensitivity. If you just keep reading about BMW and you know uh, Amazon and all that, so th there's a sense in which. We need to take ourselves seriously and either go into it because we are be, we are brilliant innovators. We need to start seeing a lot more in African innovators going into PR measurement and developing the tools, or we see more serious investments, you know, uh, from the global uh, and traditional leaders uh, investing in measurement of African media and African social media activity and language, you know, yeah. I hope I've answered your question satisfactorily. Yes, you definitely have, Nima, so well. So, I mean, now, before we come on to Laura, I mean, if anyone has any questions, then please do put them in the chat, because, or sorry, in the Q&A, um, because uh, we'll be coming on to those in a few minutes. So we look forward to receiving all of your comments. Uh, so, Laura, well, we've already had the show, Max, mentioned a few times now by different panellists, so we'll definitely be delighted to hear from you in a moment. Um, so let's look at Africa, then. it's obviously diverse and fragmented. So how does show, Max, reach an audience across multiple countries? Thanks so much. It's been such an interesting discussion and it just kind of brings home how much has really changed in the last 10 years. Also, obviously working for Showmax, I'm in a, in a wonderful position where I really do get to work with African storytellers um, through our core entertainment business and then figuring out how do we actually market that. Um, and when I go back to when I first started working on Showmax, which was in sort of 2016, it was before Netflix had even launched it was so fascinating because in the same way that Femi was talking about how little people kind of understood this digital world, um, the, the the main media weren't covering streaming because it wasn't even here. So, you know, to see how much the different categories have grown, whether it's on the social front, the digital marketing front, the fintech, as broad as it is, uh, space, and then also in streaming, to see the rate at which everything has grown has been quite phenomenal. Um, and basically what has come through strongly from all of the panelists today is just how world leading the quality is of the work that we do uh, in Africa. Um, and Showmax, of course, is you know, the leading streaming service from Africa, made in Africa for Africans. Um, and it's been an unbelievably uh, fascinating process as the brand has grown and as we've started investing in more Showmax originals in all of the markets is how do you actually you know, first of all, from the content side, tell all these stories, but then how do you market them? Um, and we've uh, seen some some phenomenal responses to our originals. 
Crime and Justice Lagos is just one uh, AMVCA in Nigeria. We've got the Real Housewives of Lagos, which was watched across the across the continent. Um, and yeah, it's been a really, really fascinating process. I think the the sort of the appetite for local stories in local languages is universal. You know, people want to see their world reflected in in the stories that they that they watch. And we can see that on the Showmax side in our in our main markets, um, in the sort of top 10, almost all of the shows are that are local shows. Kenyans want to watch Kenyan shows, South Africans want to watch South African shows. Um, and that kind of translates into the PR and social space as well. And I'm also glad that my, my PR colleagues have talked about the, the importance of social and PR. You can't really separate them anymore. Um, and what's on social is in the news. So if you don't think social is PR, you're way, you know, you're, you've, you've been left behind because, you know, news articles are often just summaries of, of tweets. It's where crises break. It's where news breaks. It's where you generally can see the first kind of, uh, media crisis bubbling up. Um, and so what's been really interesting is we've grown Showmax and started uh, working on originals outside of South Africa, in Nigeria, Ghana, uh, uh, Kenya, as well as uh, many other countries through the multi-choice group, which is the, you know, the biggest producer of content in Africa, is the importance of not having a blanket approach. The same kind of stuff that works in South Africa is not the same as the stuff that's going to work in Nigeria. Of course, there's overlap. But if you don't get that local nuance, the local flavor, the slang, you come across as a completely disconnected brand. I can't be talking about what's cool in Lagos. That would just be ridiculous. So, you know, as we've grown as a brand, you know, we work with uh, people on the ground. We've got PR specialists in market. We've got copywriters in market. We work with local agencies um, like ID Africa, who know the market incredibly well. Um, and we've seen the response to not only on the content uh, on Showmax, how much people love the local stories, but on social, the more local we've gotten, the more hyper local and um, really conversationally driven the, 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 the social media space is, the more people eat it up. So I think from my side, one of the really, really interesting changes we made as a social comms team is I let, up, I let my community managers uh, off, off the kind of leash a little bit. Um, and it was a, a strategy that our, our team kind of came up with. And we let our community managers respond in language if they are in Nigeria or in South Africa and really get that fan local voice uh, alive. So it's, it's a tricky line sometimes with a brand because, you know, if you're dealing with controversial content, you, of course, need to think about the reputation. But by just letting the teams talk about the stuff that they love in the language and the style um, of the local audiences has been really amazing to watch. Um, so yeah, I think for, for me, the most interesting thing is this, this bringing of local nuance to all of the comms work, and you can't do a blanket approach to all markets. Great, thanks, Laura, for getting us off to such a good start on the on Showmax side. Um, so, so tell us a bit now when it comes to obstacles, because obviously there are data costs. I mean, some parts of Africa obviously don't have you know the same internet connection that others do. Um, so, so tell us how you're getting across some of these types of, uh, of issues. Um, and I mean, also, I mean, now you've just been talking about you know the, the importance of local content, um, if you know, for different parts of the continent. Um, but do you think that streaming services such as yours can actually take us any closer to a borderless Africa, um, which is obviously one of the themes of the week that we're we're, uh, we're very much focused on. Yeah, again, I think um, quite a few of the conversations that came up with the panelists really sort of bring this home and how how important it is for a product that is meant for the African market considers the local obstacles and challenges. So, um, for example, Showmax was actually the first streaming service to offer offline downloads, something that was shortly followed by Netflix and many others, because we knew how important it is to give people a way to watch, even if they don't have Wi-Fi. So if you're on the Showmax app and you can do it on many of the streamers now, you can download content onto your phone uh, and you can watch it whenever you want. So, I mean, in terms of levels of access, you know, that also opens things up because your family member who is up country can then, if they're, you know, visiting their grandkids in the city, download something and watch it on the taxi or wherever they're going. Um, and then on top of that was really focusing on how to make sure that the streaming experience uses as little data as possible. 
something that isn't really relevant if you're sitting in the Netherlands and you've got like whatever a million gigabytes per second internet connection you know we've got some of the lowest possible settings so I think there's about four that you can choose from and on some of the devices it can be as low as 50 megs for an hour which is a, is a tiny amount of data but it means that then if you're stuck and you've only got your last you know gig on your phone you can actually download something and then watch it um and then kind of talking about the fintech space and payments that's another thing you know, with, with Showmax, we realize that not everyone is going to have access to credit cards. So you can pay with your Vodacom airtime. You can pay with your M-Pesa. You can pay with MTM uh, Momo. Um, and that's really, really important. And again, when you when you speak to, you know, sometimes people who come in from other countries, they're just like, well, why don't you just do credit cards? And you have to explain. It's not how it works. Our countries, many of our countries don't work like this. And actually, you have to then come up with these really innovative solutions um, which, um, as Mix was saying, are generally world leading and, and very, very innovative to solve these problems. Um, and then in terms of, again, the sort of storytelling levels of access situation, I think the other thing that's interesting with a streaming service is that you can watch anything at any time from anywhere. So, for example, Real Housewives of Lagos, which was a sensational launch, um, you know, it was watched in many other countries. It wasn't just Nigerians who were tuning in to see what was happening with uh, the Real Housewives of Lagos. Um, and I think that's something that is only going to increase as people sort of start realizing that there's this rich, rich uh, storytelling culture um, and just these incredible different local stories. And this is a trend that's happening, you know, across the world. Shows from Korea are incredibly popular in the US, in the UK, in Africa. And there's this real kind of shift uh, across the world to now look into the stories of, of, of the various African countries. We've got incredible, crazy myths. We've got incredible books. We've got, you know, all of these different stories which, um, you know, appeal to, to anyone anywhere. So I think it's an incredibly fascinating and interesting space to be in. And I wanted to just mention one more local innovation considering power shedding or load shedding. And the reason I only have one light is because I currently have no power. Um, in South Africa is that, you know, we've, we, we're not going to let these like difficulties stop us from like watching our favorite shows from, you know, doing what we need to do. We'll figure it out and we won't, we'll just, if, if you're in, in a place that has regular load shedding, nobody does anything when the power goes off. You're sitting in a restaurant and nobody even blinks. You just carry on. And I think that that sort of spirit of kind of facing quite difficult challenges and then finding these really innovative solutions is, is really inspiring. And then, yeah, with the youth, with social, with all of this digital stuff that's moving so quickly, that's just another space that um, I think we're going to see a lot of innovation. When I see what the influencers and video producers do in Nigeria, I mean, it's amazing. Like the professionalism of, you know, just, you know, anyone who's producing in, in some of these countries is quite phenomenal. Um, and then, you know, being able to connect with our audience where they want to be is also really interesting. So, you know, we can create these great stories and then we make sure that they're on TikTok. And I mean, seeing the kind of stuff that people come up with is hilarious. Um, and um, yeah, it's an incredibly exciting space to be working in. Um, yeah, and I can't wait to see actually what happens in all of these areas because they're all developing so very quickly. Great. Well, thank you, Laura, for sharing that with us. And uh, in fact, we've only got a few minutes left. So if anyone has any questions, then do pop them straight away in the Q&A. Um, I mean, one question that, uh, that occurs to me listening to all of you who are taking together um, is to say, you know, now who's going to be the main storyteller of Africa in the future, let's say five years from now? Because on the one hand, we've got incredible, you know, professional produced content by uh, by Showmax and others. Uh, but we've also got, you know, the youth on, the, you know, creating all of their own contents and so on. So, uh, so let, let me start with you, Mix. I mean, I mean like, say, five years from now, if we're all sitting here back again in Africa Communications Week, what, what do you think we'll be saying then? It's like, like, who do you think will be sending out the most impactful sort of stories about Africa by that point? I'm hoping entrepreneurs. I am, this is, <laughs> I am <laughs> on the, I, my 11 year old calls me a boomer. I had to Google what that was. Okay. So oh, no, I'm going to go with, I'm a, <laughs> I'm, so yeah, and I told him the other day, he mustn't forget who feeds him. Yeah, um, but, <laughs> but uh, for me, I think it's entrepreneurs, to be honest. I think the purpose of why they're doing this, you know, or the beauty of what's coming up, whether you look at malaria testing using magnets and lights out of Uganda, 
where they use in South Africa, using cell phone towers to power devices, not solar. Uh, the, the stories, that, the need that is, is on the ground is real. And I think them communicating that their personal stories and the purpose of why they're actually doing it is going to be critical. So from my point of view, I'm hoping to see more African voices on the global stage. I'm hoping to see more money in the entrepreneurial space and more, more African success stories. Because to be honest with you, if you look at the top 11 fintechs in Africa, you're seeing a white American there as a founder. I mean, that's, is that really an African company? You know, we need to have more African stories, more African founders, more African opportunities and people sharing the stories, not people claiming to be an African company and then look at us, how we're changing the world. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping African entrepreneurs. All right. Excellent. Thank you. The mix. Uh, Femi, what do you think? Who do you think is going to be telling the great African story five years from now? Hopefully not AI. Um, because... <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, hopefully chat GPT will be dead by then. And something oh, hopefully, hopefully not chat GPT or, or mid journey, <laughs> any of those guys. I, I think entertainers, and, and I'm biased because um, I, I love entertainment and uh, we are invested in a lot of entertainment. I think entertainers will, will continue to, to tell the, the African stories. Um, and and even um, entrepreneurs um, that uh, Mix is, is rooting for, they will need entertainers to also help them uh, uh, tell that story. So for, for me, I'm rooting for entertainers, um, and I believe strongly in the power of entertainment, especially for Africa, uh, telling African stories. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much for me. Uh, Neymar, what do you think? Well, allow me to throw a, a spanner in the works because uh, I don't see the geographical binary uh, working here. When you look at, and I'll give you, I'm sorry to give you gloomy examples, but just look at ISIS and Al-Shabaab and, you know, I, I wouldn't talk too much about Boko Haram. Young people from all over the world have been able to resonate with a message uh, uh, that was started by young people either in Syria or in Somalia or in Kenya. And they've been able to mobilize ridiculous re amount of resources. They've been able to literally beat government machinery that you know, is, is prepared you know, for war. And they've been able to drive majority of those wars for longer than we, than we anticipated they would last. Uh, they've been able to, to really evolve radicalization and and you know and basically you know just equip uh, cr both crime and terrorism online you know by hiding in plain sight you know very sophisticated you know covert messaging tools so when you actually look at the power of storytelling the way it has been employed by Afri young africans it has the it has the the the, the, the potential to create ambassadors from Asia, America, you know, because what connects them is the issues. It's not so much, you know, the color of the skin that sometimes plays a role, you know, like look at Black Lives Matter, you know, uh, sparking, you know, revolutions in Asia, now fair and lovely in Kenya has been rebranded because of something that started, you know, with the Black Lives Matter. So we can't quite limit, you know, or give a, a range, you know, in terms of geographical binary. What we can is watch for the issues that are evolving. What is it that they, they care about today? And, and what is it, even if they don't care about it today, what is it that is going to impact their lives um, today and in the future? What's going to influence their access to money? What's going to influence you know, the, the ability to put food on the table? Because even if it's not something that they're caring about today, in the next few um, years, you'll begin, they'll begin to galvanize support around those issues and they will get, you know, unlikely uh, support and, you know, so I think there's there's a great opportunity for, for it to go everywhere. It, we just have to understand, you know, the, the trends and what, uh, what issues the young people care about the most. So I think it's young people. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Anima. Laura, what do you think? Who do you think is going to be the storyteller of the future? Well, Showmax's ambition is to be the leading streaming service in Africa. Yeah. So you know, watch the space. 
<laughs> Excellent. So um, yeah, we're short and sweet. So I, I do now have a couple of questions from Clifford. Um, so uh, so let me start with the first one. I think that the first one I think can be for Femi. Um, so Femi, how can African businesses leverage digital connectivity to expand their reach and to access new markets within the continent? So Femi, what would you say to that? Um, I, I'll just summarize what everybody has said, um, because that answers the question. Um, Mix talked about how entrepreneurs should be better storytellers. So the uh, business owners or leadership or leaders, you know, and as PR people are always encouraging um, the leaders of businesses to be thought leaders, to be uh, opinion lead, opinion shapers, to be uh, knowledge sources. I think that would definitely um, um, be a great way to do that. Um, I think uh, Nima spoke about the young people, what do they care about? Uh, if the bulk of, of Africa, uh, median age in Africa is about 19, I, I believe. And, and that shows we are a very young population, the, the world's youngest continent, really. And so you, what young people care about or don't care about um, is very important for us to know. So as businesses, we should identify these things and, and know how to respond appropriately to them. And then um, um, I, I think platforms like Showmax also offer an opportunity, even though the primary uh, product is entertainment, but it, it shows you the power of entertainment. And like I said, I, I'm rooting for entertainers. And I think brands need to understand how to use entertainment better for storytelling, uh, for even promoting their own products and for engaging their audiences. Okay, thank you very much for me. I have one question in relation to AI, which I will perhaps hand over to uh, to Neema. So the question is, how can PR practitioners ensure that AI driven data analytics and insights are effectively interpreted and used to inform strategic decision making, rather than relying solely on automated responses and recommendations from AI tools? So, uh, so, so Neema, let's hopefully there's, there's still some real human elements there, we hope. Yeah, and you know, I'm also a teacher. So this is actually, by, this is, would be a question my students would also ask. Uh, number one, you need to remember that AI tools, most AI tools that we have now don't have up-to-date information. They always have, you know, I think they, they, they upload, you know, whatever data, we used to call it big data. You know, they, uh, they, the universe of, you know, billions of data points that on their own don't make sense but if you if you have a way of bringing them together and analyzing very very quickly it can give you useful information so basically that is what makes ai powerful so their their, their ability to synchronize you know the big data and synthesize it in a way that it can give you useful information however that is usually missing two things one uh, one that laura talked about nuance you know so there's some nuances that will always be lacking there's cultural uh, geographical and you know uh, sensitivity that a lot of the ai you know has has not reached yet and i don't think is going to always be up to date if it did then we would really be concerned about completely you know re uh, replacing humans so it's the ability to understand you know uh, the nuances the language deviations i've not seen an AI tool that speaks Sheng. Sheng is like, you know, the pigeon of, of Kenya, you know, so until the it's AI tools are able to adapt, you know, in real time and how our language evolves, it evolves, you know, in real time. And so un until the, the tools are able to reach there, we still need human beings to do extra work. So maybe use the AI tools to generate a first draft, but you have to take to do some additional ones or, create your, you know, uh, to avoid bias, start with your own analytics and then use AI to add on whatever you think, you know, uh, might have been lost. So there's always going to be need for, for you to just learn how to do measurements, for you to, to learn how to do, you know, some of the old school, uh, to use some of the old school tools so that they can complement, but definitely AI is is a game changer in, in the fact that it can give you a lot more and save you a lot of time. You know, you don't have to go collecting primary data. 
Great, thank you very much, Nima. Well, we're almost out of time. Um, in fact, I see we do maybe have just one or uh, we would click if it says thank you for the answers. So thanks everyone for those. Um, so well, a very last question from me just before we wind up. So, uh, so the theme of the session today has been about building digital bridges in the context of a borderless Africa for communications. Um, so, uh, so, so I'll say just a quick answer from each of you. Um, do, do you think we will ever have a borderless Africa for communications? And, uh, and would that even be a good thing or will we always have local nuance uh, what would you say, Mix? Can I plead the fifth? Yeah, okay. <laughs> you're your um, screen, so you can go next. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So it's personally, I think I'd love to see it. I think we're starting to see it when it comes to the financial technology space. I mean, cross-border payments, um, you know, and the use of the seamless integration between the various countries is happening. There's still got a lot of challenges and a lot of nuances per country. I mean, M-Pesa worked very well in Kenya and, and didn't in South Africa, for example, right? So you've got, the, I think there's still a lot of nuances we have to have to go through. But I would, I mean, these days in most African countries, you don't need to carry cash anymore, you know, because the, the solutions are there. You know, I'm in Rwanda, I use Mobo. Okay, it integrates automatically with my bank in Mauritius. You know, so it's, it's, it's happening, but I think there's still quite a ways to go. And I think the central bank governors just need to calm down and let people play. <laughs> Great, thank you, Mix. Uh, so, Femi, what do you think? Are we getting anywhere near a borderless Africa when it comes to communication? Um, I do not think so. Um, and I think mostly the, the challenge is mostly politics. Um, and I don't see how the politicians will, will create that borderless Africa that then enables um, every other thing to be built on top. However, the, 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 the positive for me is what the technologists are doing. You know, they are creating the borderless um, communication, integration, collaboration. I think creatives are doing the same. You know, it's, it didn't take the Nigerian government sitting with the South African government for there to be a mashup of Afrobeats and Amar Piano. It happened organically because creatives just wanted to collaborate. So I have, I'm putting my faith in, in the youth. I'm putting my faith in, in creatives to create the, 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 the to, to break the borders. And I think it's not just within Africa. I think it's a global thing, you know. So cultures are becoming global cultures. Consumer cultures are, are overlapping. And I think that will continue to happen as technology gets better. Great, thank you, Femi. Neymar, what do you think? A borderless communication, will we have it? Do we want it? What would you say? I think we will have it. And we are, in some ways, we're already having it. Again, I love my young people, the, the, they always lead, you know, so I, I mentioned earlier three cases that have been launched in Kenya that have the potential of changing how Facebook operates globally, even outside of Africa. All those three cases have been brought to, to the Kenyan courts by non-Kenyans. So two, uh, uh, the first one has been brought in by a South African. The second one was brought in by two Ethiopians. And then the third one is a what we would call a class action, you know. So it's 184 yeah, you know, uh young um techies. And you know, the lead is the first, you know, the lead, the first two names that you know keep re reappearing. The first one is uh South African and the second one is a is a Nigerian. So when you actually look at, you know, it's the power to, to see opportunities. If you can't get justice, you know, in your country, which platform can you use to do that? And when you look at the impact that these cases are having, what they're advocating for is going to change how we communicate and how the platforms, you know, uh, in, in, in fact, the, the case by the Ethiopians is literally challenging the algorithm in terms of how it promotes um, violence across Africa, you know, basically saying Facebook must change its algorithm because it puts black lives, black African lives in danger more than it does in other parts of the world. It's a very, very bold pursuit. And for that to be pursued in a, in a, in a Kenyan court by non-Kenyans, you know, it shows a lot of that borderless, you know, interaction. So I think because money has become borderless and money influences even the politicians that is what is going to lead us to uh, closer towards that because a lot of us communicators communicate you know uh, to create and manage relationships that are very you know financial in nature so because you know if this is being led by you know 
basically following where the resources are being allocated and who has control over them, that's what's going to give the motivation to go borderless. And also, together as, as an African you know, market, we command quite a lot. You know, individually with a 10 million, 40 million there, you can be ignored by almost everyone. But when you speak in one voice, I think that's the power of the Africa free trade uh, area. And I really am rooting for it. Great, thank you very much, Sanima. So Laura, we're happy to, uh, happy to finish with you. So, so tell us then, in terms of communication, do you think there'll ever be a borderless Africa? I don't think that the borders will ever be completely gone. And I think it would be a, a, a real loss if we didn't have the local nuance and flavor and color from each of the different uh, countries. That said, streaming globally and streaming in Africa is absolutely cutting through borders in terms of access to entertainment and stories. So yeah, we can see it happening and I'm sure it's just gonna continue to grow as we learn more and can access more from other countries around us. Great, thank you very much, Laura, for uh, finishing off. Uh, so well, well, thank you, everyone. It's been an absolute pleasure having all of you with us. Thank you to Migs, to Femi, to uh, to Neyma, and to Laura, and to all of the attendees that have joined us. Um, we, we do have Africa Communications Week on still tomorrow uh, for the last day for Friday. Um, and at CIPR International, we do also have one more webinar, which is at exactly the same time as today. Um, so the topic for tomorrow is how to communicate the successes of women in Africa. Uh, so we've got a wonderful lineup for that. So uh, all the details are on the Africa Communications Communications Week website uh, of all of tomorrow's events. So, uh, so that just leaves me then to thank everyone and uh, look forward to seeing you all again soon. Bye then. Take care. Bye everyone. Bye. 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 Bye everyone. Bye. Bye.